up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. I'm going to start with a couple of quotes by Jane Jacobs, the, uh, the well-known urbanist, as she's often called. These quotes are both from her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which was first published in 1961. Uh, the first one is painted on a concrete wall along Christie Street in downtown Toronto, and it goes, Cities have the capacity of providing something for everybody, only because, and only when, they are created by everybody. So that's the kind of quote that you can't argue with. It's very general, it's undeniably good, and I think it's undeniably true. Of course, if something is created by everybody, then it will probably have something for everybody. And the second quote is from the same book. I don't think this one is on any murals, though. It certainly wouldn't be on any murals in uh, affordable housing projects, for example. Anyway, uh, it's from one of her many critiques of modernist city planning, and I'll read it to you. It goes, the projects that today most urgently need salvaging are low-income housing projects. These failures drastically affect the everyday lives of many people, especially children. Moreover, because they are too dangerous, demoralizing, and unstable within themselves, they make it too hard in many cases to maintain tolerable civilization in their vicinities. Now, this episode is a history of Toronto's Regent Park community. And just to be clear, Jane Jacobs in those last two quotes, she wasn't talking about Regent Park. Uh, it had just been built around the time that she wrote that. She was an American, and so she was talking about American housing projects that were already 20 or 30 years old by 1961. But the quotes are relevant because her ideas on cities are an important part of the thinking behind the current redevelopment of Regent Park, the Regent Park Revitalization, as it's called. And more broadly, I think those views are still taken as common sense in most of the discussions around planning and urban policy in, in this day and age. And I want to contrast those views, those hegemonic views, with uh, some memories, some perspectives from people who actually lived in one of these low-income housing projects that Jane Jacobs thought were, were so awful. So here is a quote from a woman who lived in Regent Park as a teenager around the time that the death and life of great American cities was first published. I, it started with me asking her to describe what Regent Park looked like during her youth in the 50s and early 60s, and this is what she told me. She said, we had a small playground right out front of our houses, uh, two painted hopscotch courts, a slide, three swings, I think there was a sandbox for a while. Me and my friends once flooded the parking area behind our houses for a splash pad, and we would march around the circle of the driveway playing band or having picnics or doing crafts in the, in the grass circle out front of our houses. My dad flooded our backyard every winter for us to skate, and then two other neighbors did it too, and we had our own hockey rink. And it continues. There, there's more. She said, in the summer, someone always had their water sprinkler going. There were all kinds of different playgrounds around region, and we can go to any one of them. There were never any roads we had to cross. And then what all of this uh, amounts to, this is the quote that became the title of, of this episode. She said, whoever planned South Region did a great job. And that view is pretty typical of what most people from that generation told me about life in Regent Park. But people from later generations described it in, in similar terms as well. And, and this is just one sample of that. This is a piece of an interview I did with somebody who grew up in Regent Park in the 1980s. And she said that there was a feeling of community, like everyone was a family. There was a feeling of safety, so many eyes on you, people telling you to do up your coat and your shoelaces, parents walking kids to school in groups together. So I heard something like that about the 60s, about the 80s. I heard a similar story from young people who were children in Regent Park in the 2000s decade as well. And it was very important to a lot of the people I spoke to that others know this about their time in Regent Park. To them, this was the, the real story of Regent Park. So I thought it was a good way to begin this episode, which is a history of Regent Park. So what I'm about to show you are some highlights from the research I did for my PhD dissertation, which for those who aren't familiar, a dissertation is um, kind of similar to a book. It's about as long. It's not quite as polished. Um, it's based on original research. So mine is called Keeping the Kids Out of Trouble, Extra Domestic Labor and Social Reproduction in Toronto's Regent Park from 1959 to 2012. Um, so I finished this in 2017. It's based on research I did a few years before that. The goal is to get it published someday. 
which I'll need, need to do some new research and updates and things here and there. But for now, it's the subject of this episode, and this is my plan for what I'm about to show you in the, uh, I guess, hour or so that follows. So we're going to start with an historical overview of Regent Park, just to kind of give the story some structure. I'll share some more memories from the first gen generation of Regent Parkers, and uh, as I get into the 70s and the 80s, I'll talk about how residents built community and made Regent Park a decent place to live in spite of some serious challenges through those years. Um, I'll talk about the impact of neoliberalism upon Regent Park in the 90s, and then I'll conclude with some participant observation field work I did as a local resident during the early stages of the redevelopment. And all throughout, I'll be doing a bit more of what I began this episode with. I'll be comparing how Regent Park has been portrayed by planners, by professionals, by the media, etc. Um, comparing those portrayals to how it's portrayed by people who actually lived in it. And just a content warning. When I get to the material about the 1970s, I will have to discuss sexual violence against children. There won't be anything graphic, but the topic does come up. It's an important part of the story. So this is Regent Park North, built in the late 1940s, 1950s. From a distance like this, it looked almost exactly the same up until 2005, when the first demolitions began. So many of the buildings you see here have since been demolished. Uh, several are still standing, but they'll be gone in a couple of years as well. And uh, this is Keynesian ideology in built form. So here's what I mean by that, Keynesian ideology in built form. In the late 1940s, there was a serious housing shortage in downtown Toronto. There, there wasn't enough housing for all the soldiers coming home from World War II and their families. And a lot of the housing that did exist was, was very old and in poor condition, especially in a part of the city that was then known as Cabbage Town, which was known as the so-called slum in the vocabulary of the day. So the idea was the government can intervene and solve these two problems at once. Demolish the slum and replace it with this huge modern nonprofit housing project called Regent Park. So the plan was people could move into Regent Park, live there, pay a relatively low rent based on their income, um, ideally save up for a house, and then move out of Regent Park after a few years, and then someone else can come in and, and do the same thing. Now, th this is Keynesian thinking, which I talked about in a couple of prior episodes. The idea that the state, a.k.a. the government, should, should intervene in the economy and provide social goods like decent housing for the benefit of everyone and to kind of have an overall stabilizing effect on the system. So to give you an idea of uh, how this was presented to the public at the time, I recommend watching a documentary by the National Film Board from 1954 called Farewell to Oak Street. So it's available for free. It's linked in the description. I recommend pausing this, watching that, and then coming back to my video. I think what I find most interesting about that video are the, the, the problems it mentions that Regent Park was expected to solve when it was first built. Problems like a housing shortage, uh, overcrowding, fire hazards. Those are problems that new housing, I think, can fix. But there are other problems mentioned, and just to repeat some of the vocabulary from the 50s that was used in that film from the 50s, uh, it mentioned issues that, that housing can't fix. Alcoholism, so-called broken marriages, and so-called juvenile delinquency. Um, so on the note of broken marriages, that's, that's just divorce. But in the 50s, that was seen as a social problem, so it was given this kind of judgmental name of broken marriages, and uh, neighborhoods that had more of those were seen as a problem. Anyway, there are, there are three issues with this that I want to note and emphasize. The first one is those problems were never as bad in Regent Park as people thought they were. Uh, second one is those problems exist in every neighborhood and among every social class. And the third one is you can't solve those problems alone with, with housing policy. And the, the thought that you could solve those problems with housing policy, or the fact that you would even try, those are examples of what I call moral regulation, this effort to kind of try to make the working class better behaved through social policy. Um, it's stigmatizing, it's, uh, it's patronizing, it doesn't work anywhere. So because it can't work, it didn't work in Regent Park. So in any neighborhood, in any city, people will continue to, to drink and, and get divorced, and teenagers will continue to, to you know, cause problems and break things, whether it's Regent Park, whether it's an upper middle class neighborhood. It happens everywhere, and you can't stop it with, with just housing. So because it didn't work, uh, politicians, journalists, philanthropists, other elites, decided that Regent Park was a failure by about the late 1960s. 
So the name Regent Park almost became synonymous with like bad urban planning. Um, and from there, its residents were, were stigmatized very harshly. Uh, throughout the same period, most surrounding neighborhoods were, were gentrified. They were also low-income neighborhoods that transitioned into you know, middle and upper-income neighborhoods. And uh, more on that story in a bit. This is just kind of a, a brief outline of the history to get started. As Canada became officially multicultural, uh, beginning in the early 70s, more on that in my previous couple of episodes, uh, Regent Park soon became one of the most multicultural neighborhoods in Toronto. So for example, some stats from around the time the redevelopment began, by 2006, uh, two-thirds of Regent Park residents were born outside of Canada, and there were 70 different languages spoken in the community. Through the 80s and 90s, there were a few attempts to have all or part of the community redeveloped. Uh, those plans involved some tenants. Uh, they, they didn't happen, though, until the Regent Park revitalization was officially announced in 2002. So, in the simplest terms, what the revitalization is doing is that the plan is to tear down all the old housing and replace it with a mix of subsidized housing, market rentals, and condominiums. So. They are replacing every unit of social housing eventually, and anyone who moves to make way for the redevelopment is guaranteed a place in the new region park. Now, it's not that simple in practice, of course, so there's some important qualifiers to this that I want to mention. The first one is, after living somewhere else for five or so years, not everybody is willing to pack up and move again back to the neighborhood they're entitled to return to. Um, second one is, there were some important exceptions to that right of return. So in the first phase of redevelopment, uh, way back in 2009, there were three buildings that were built outside of Regent Park and considered replacement units. So the people who took apartments in those did not get to return to Regent Park after all. That was very controversial, and the Housing Authority has promised that it will, it will never happen again. Um, and a another important thing to emphasize is that when the plan is complete, uh, less than one-fifth of the housing in Regent Park will be rent geared to income housing, down from 100%, of course. And uh, another thing that's worth emphasizing is that when the plan was first announced, it was supposed to be a, a 10 or a 12 year process, but we're now in year uh, 18 and still in phase three out of the five phases. So what I'm about to show you is historical ethnography. And this is what it's based on. I, I interviewed about 60 people who lived in Regent Park at one point or another. Um, I did a lot of archival research, including reading every newspaper article that ever mentioned the phrase Regent Park over the period that I studied, which adds up to uh, over 10,000 articles. Um, I did some other archival research, and the main ingredient, the most important part, was the participant observation fieldwork that I did um, living in the area during the early phases of, of the redevelopment. So back to the early days of Regent Park. This is the Capital Cleaners Hornets, a, a boys hockey team sponsored by a local laundromat. Um, this was probably 1960, 1961. Since around this time, Regent Park has been stereotyped as, as a place of violence and vandalism and despair. Uh, some people say there's some truth to this, but most people said it's a stereotype. And for the most part, Regent Park was a, a decent place to live. Um, like I said at the beginning of this video, a lot of modern day policy and planning literature kind of takes it as common sense that modernist housing projects like Regent Park somehow cut people off from their surroundings to the point that they, they trap people into you know unpleasant uh, lifestyles and they make people close-minded. So it's true to some extent that Regent Park was, was like a working class enclave and, and it was quite insular at times. but. Many of the people I interviewed said those were actually good things. So the, the fact that it was an entirely working class community uh, let people establish these kind of networks of mutual aid, you know, helping each other out. And it also gave people a break from the stigma that they faced when they went outside of Regent Park. And that stigma would usually be expressed in the form of, uh, you know, attitudes from their more privileged peers, from their teachers, from their bosses. Nobody felt that while well inside the community but they felt it when they were outside of that, that kind of working class enclave. Regent Park was uh, actually built as two separate projects, Regent Park North and Regent Park South, and each was built on land that had been cleared through the demolition of most of Cabbage Town, which at that point was a poor and working class community uh, commonly known as, as a slum. Um, the development of Regent Park North was approved by a vote in 1947, so on the same ballot that people used to vote for the mayor that year, 
They also voted for or against funding Regent Park North, and 62% uh, voted in favor, which sounds democratic, except you had to be a property owner or a, a long-term leaseholder to be eligible to vote in that one. Um, and, you know, only 20% of the properties that were about to be demolished to make way for this were owner-occupied. Um, anyway, a couple of years later, people had to vote to provide even more money for Regent Park North, and again, they approved it. And, and the main advocate for a yes vote was uh, this group called the Citizens Housing and Planning Association, which was this really diverse sort of coalition ranging from wealthy philanthropists to, to social workers to uh, members of the Communist Party. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around this in today's political context, but that was the case in 1940, in the late 1940s. And on the no side, uh, those advocating against funding Regent Park, um, a lot of this charge was led by an association of private home builders who said that doing this would be one big step towards communism. But their side lost. Uh, Regent Park North was funded and built a couple of years later. Regent Park South was built through a different process that did not involve seeking the public's approval. And so Regent Park South, for that reason, was controversial from pretty much the beginning. Um, anyway, people began moving into Regent Park North in 1949, and construction in the area continued until South was completed in 1959. So the, the, the first project, the north side, consisted largely of low-rise buildings, uh, townhouses, while south was mostly mid-rise buildings and some, some townhouses, and both had a lot of green space um, between the buildings, uh, sports fields, playgrounds, and just kind of open expanses of, of grass. So that's what some have called the suburbanization of the city, uh, replacing older neighborhoods with these single-use uh, insular enclaves for nuclear families. Um, sometimes in the present, this gets described as, as the worst idea ever, and, and almost like Regent Park was the only place where this happened. But Regent Park wasn't really that unique for the time that it was built, because back in the post-war era, the suburbs were where you wanted to be. Um, you know, everybody had a car, gas was cheap, highways were new and exciting. There was no reason not to live a half hour from downtown, either in a house with a nice big backyard or in a, in a luxury apartment tower. So Regent Park, in some ways, was an attempt to create that, you know, that ideal suburban you know, lifestyle and, and environment, create that downtown. So it wasn't really that uncommon for its time. And now back to the point that I began with. Uh, Jane Jacobs, the famous planning critic, once said that many low-income housing projects were too dangerous, demoralizing, and unstable within themselves to maintain tolerable civilization in their vicinities. And one reason she said that was because she felt those projects lacked things like well-watched, continuously used public spaces, and so they did not have the, the natural supervision of children that uh, you know more um, desirable neighborhoods did. But again, many people I spoke to said that Regent Park was indeed very well supervised for children. And so one of the most common stories I heard, I, I was told this by people from all generations, was that you could have a, a relatively small number of adults keeping track of a bunch of kids all at once by letting the kids play in the open space between buildings and, and kind of keep a watch on them from the distance of their apartments and their townhouses. So a kid who did something wrong would get reprimanded on the spot by whatever adult happened to be watching at that time and then the kid would get in trouble a second time at home because their parents would find out what they did before they even got there. So it meant that uh, you know kids were indeed very well supervised. People watched out for each other's kids, and uh, you know kids had a kind of wide range of adults who they could also trust. In terms of what the planners said about this place, uh, Regent Park North was was judged a success at first, but South was seen as a problem nearly as soon as it opened. And then by the late 1960s, both were judged as failures by the media, by government investigators, and even by some of the, uh, the initial you know, professionals who have been advocating to have this thing built in the first place. But again, if you speak to people who grew up in it, very few remember it as a terrible place. And of the people I spoke to, it was those who lived there in the late 50s and the 60s who generally had the most positive memories. But Regent Park did lack some important things. For example, it didn't have a swimming pool until 1973. Until then, the closest place to swim was the Don River, which was very polluted even then. And the next closest place was a pool uh, about two kilometers away across the Don Valley in the Riverdale neighborhood. The commute to that Riverdale pool was often dangerous because instead of using city streets to take a long, inconvenient route, uh, many youth would take a shortcut that included a very dangerous run across a train bridge. 
So in a span of four years, there were three children who were killed by trains on that bridge. After the third child was killed, Regent Parkers demanded the city build a pool in their community, and they also raised almost $3,000 towards that pool, which is about $20,000 in today's terms. Um, but finally, all three levels of government agreed to fund the pool instead, and so the money that people had raised for it was converted into a, a scholarship fund for kids uh, finishing grade 8. The point is the built environment was by no means fundamentally flawed. It did lack some things, but what it did lack, residents, including children, fought for. And by fighting for those things, people developed this strong sense of ownership over the place, and through that they, they made it a community. And that point became especially important into the 70s and the 80s. Now, the reality is many people were indeed quite poor. But as children, they didn't know they were poor until they came in, into contact with uh, kids from other neighborhoods or later on uh, through their, their co-workers or their bosses. And so time spent in Regent Park in a lot of ways was, was a break from that. Youth had a strong sense of ownership over that, that space. So here's an image of some teenagers hanging out in front of a restaurant in 1964 that was labeled Regent Park Gang. Now, there's no real indication that they were a gang. They were probably just hanging out which is the key part of how working class people, especially youth, engage with urban space. And it's often labeled loitering, but you know, really it's just standing around in front of a restaurant. And here's a quote from someone of that generation that I think sums this up uh, pretty clearly. He said, there used to be a place in North Region where we'd always meet called The Barrier. It was a gathering, a hangout. We never disrespected any of the families. We never created havoc. We never had the cops come. We just hang out and socialize, and that was it. And we treated everybody with respect. A lot of people did that with us, too, and it was great. It was a real community thing. Now, people tend to be nostalgic about their youth, so in reality, there were, I'm sure, some fights. I'm sure some youth did disrespect some people. But the point is, it was a lively place that people cared about. It was not somewhere too dangerous, demoralizing, and unstable for tolerable civilization, as, as Jane Jacobs once said. If you've ever studied criminology, you may have heard of this book, Defensible Space by Oscar Newman. This is where the idea of crime prevention through environmental design came from. The idea that housing developments or any other urban environment should be designed in a way that makes people feel like they're always being watched and also that they're kind of compelled to always watch each other or mutual surveillance. So shortly after this was published, Newman himself toured Regent Park in 1973 and he said that it lacked this divine principle. Regent Park did not have crime prevention through environmental design, and as a result, it was fundamentally unsafe. And you still, to this day, hear urban planners, journalists, others, repeat this idea like it's the absolute truth. But again, nobody I interviewed who lived in Regent Park at the time said that Regent Park was unsafe in this way. And, uh, you know, when I tried to describe defensible space theory to them, and also the idea that Regent Park did not have this, Many people thought it was ridiculous. They talked about how residents did indeed, you know, look out for each other, check up on each other, watch over each other, maybe even too much so, right? So th there were actual safety problems in Regent Park, just not this one. And there was a, a tenant newsletter, like a newspaper that was made by and for tenants. And it, in, at one point in 1972, it made a list of uh, the, the key safety problems uh, affecting Regent Park at that time and they included things like people not from Regent Park sleeping in the hallways and the stairwells of the buildings uh, people speeding in the driveways people fixing and storing cars in the parking lots who did not live there so rather than blaming architecture for these problems the Tennis Association blamed the non-residents who were engaging in this behavior and the Tenant Association also proposed some pretty easy fixes for this so the problem wasn't some fundamental flaw in architecture. They were, it was, you know, smaller problems that could be solved by things like hiring live-in superintendents, which are now kind of taken for granted in most buildings. Uh, you could have, you know, police, security, checking up on the parking lots and the driveways. And uh, you could also install front door locks. So it's kind of hard to imagine today, but at that time, the front doors of these apartment buildings did not have locks on them, so anybody could just come and go in the buildings. So the problem was not architecture. It was not a lack of crime prevention through environmental design. The problem was there were no, you know, the, the, the security measures that are now taken for granted everywhere, like front door locks, didn't exist. So, you know, they, 
they convinced management to install some locks on the front doors as a so-called pilot project. And uh, surprise, surprise, it worked. And the bigger point is that these problems that did exist, they were caused, I think, by the stigmatization of Regent Park. That's what made outsiders feel entitled to abuse the built environment and their actions damaged the built environment and thus, you know, fed into the stereotypes that fed the stigma in the first place and so it continued as, as a vicious cycle. In any case, I think by 1968 the stigmatization of Regent Park was, uh, was really instilled when the Toronto Star called Regent Park South a quote, colossal flop and Regent Parkers were then stereotyped as, as kind of ungrateful, entitled riffraff and meanwhile, many of the surrounding neighborhoods were gentrified, while Regent Park remained one of the last parts of downtown Toronto that outsiders uh, were still afraid of, which probably makes it sound like an awful place to live, but according to many, it was not at all. Here's a letter to the editor of the Toronto Star from 1979, written by a woman from Regent Park who was tired of reading about how awful her community apparently was. So I'll just read this out. She said, I, I am sick and tired of hearing about drab, desolate Regent Park. I live in Regent Park. The outside is a beautiful oasis in the midst of a city. It is truly a park with lots of green grass, ball diamonds, playgrounds, two skating rings, our own swimming pool, trees, wooden tables and benches outside the buildings, sandboxes. It's gorgeous. Do you know how many areas are fighting this city for just one patch of grass in the whole neighborhood? As for apartments, neither I nor any of my friends have drab apartments. They are cozy, clean, well-furnished, tastefully decorated. Much can be done with a little money if one puts one's mind to it. Now that last quote might be laying it on a bit thick. Uh, not everybody I spoke to described it as a beautiful oasis. But still, it's an example, I think, of the frustration people felt with constantly seeing their neighborhood described as like the, the worst place in the city, if not the country. Um, so how else did people make Regent Park a nice community? Well, through what I call extra domestic labor. Now, you're, you're probably familiar with the concept of domestic labor to at least some extent. That comes out of feminist theory in the 60s. And the point of uh, the domestic labor concept is that traditionally in our own society and in many others, men worked outside the home for wages and women took care of the household. So because running a household does not directly generate you know, money, it was usually taken for granted and not given the same respect as men's wage labor. But of course, somebody has to make the food, keep the house clean, take care of the kids. Otherwise, not just the family, but all of society would fall apart. So in the 60s, feminists started calling those tasks domestic labor to establish how important they are. So I'll expand on this and give some examples as I go through the rest of the episode, but you know, in, in my research I expanded that domestic labor concept to include what I call extra domestic labor, everyday tasks done outside the home that made Regent Park a livable place. And my point is, in an average middle class community, people can usually count on the state, the, the government, to keep the areas outside their home safe and secure. And I argue that in Regent Park, people had to do a lot of that work themselves in a kind of unique way. And that's not because of architecture, however, it's because of stigma. So I'd say on the whole, domestic labor came about as a way of describing women's unwaged work for the most part. So on that note, women probably did more extra domestic labor than men, but it wasn't quite as gender specific as domestic labor often is. I'll, I'll explain more about this as I go through the rest of the, the episode. So my question was, uh, you mentioned how everyone watched out for everyone's children. Were the adults strict? Could the kid get away with much in Regent Park? And the response, on our block, no way. Anybody's mother would yell at you to stop doing that or would be off to tell your parents what you were up to. And we all had to be in before the streetlights came on. It was always the mothers who did the disciplining. And there was always a mother to break up a fight, so no one ever really got hurt. So childcare is one example of how people did this kind of domestic work informally and cooperatively with people outside their own households. And my point is, this was essential to making a stigmatized and increasingly preyed upon place secure and livable. And it's through this kind of labor that Regent Parkers built community. Regent Park also had its own mechanisms for dealing with external threats, and these threats were very serious at times. And this is where the content warning comes in. I'll need to speak about sexual violence against children. One person I interviewed, and in his words, he said being from Regent Park was like having a target on your back for pedophiles. There's a lot of research on how predators tend to target vulnerable people, and Regent Park children would have looked especially vulnerable 
because the place was so stigmatized. Um, another person I spoke to said that, you know, she, she said pretty much the same thing and remembered almost being abducted twice as a child. And she also remembered in 1973 when there was a mob of people who went out looking for the murderer of a nine-year-old boy. Uh, some people I spoke to personally remember Gordon Stuckless, who was the serial abuser of children at Maple Leaf Gardens back when it was a professional hockey arena. Uh, Stuckless also once volunteered at a school in Regent Park. But people also described growing up, you know, being constantly vigilant and concerned about this, this threat of these predators, but also being kept safe most of the time because everybody knew everybody and everybody watched out for everybody, as one of them put it. But it was the murder of 12-year-old Emmanuel Jacques in 1977 that made people worry for their children's safety like never before. And that's not just Regent Park, this is also citywide. Jacques was lured from Young Street, which is the main commercial strip about two kilometers uh, away from Regent Park where he had been shining shoes, which was a fairly common practice at the time. And four days after he disappeared, his body was found on the roof of a massage parlor, and it was determined he had been raped and murdered by four men. Now in the aftermath, people in Regent Park, also citywide, also nationwide, reacted with horror and outrage, and in some cases, extreme homophobia. There was a rally led by an Anglican minister who lived in Regent Park, at that rally, people demanded a, a so-called cleanup of the Young Street sin strip. They demanded capital punishment for murderers and sex offenders. Some media reported there was a petition going around to, quote, stamp out gays and body rubs. And that petition got a thousand signatures. There was a longtime tenant activist who led 150 people in a standing ovation at the local police station after the men were arrested. And the headline for that one was, Friction Disappears as Regent Park Cheers Its Police. Homophobia was very common and completely socially accepted at the time. It was normal to believe that, you know, being gay was an illness or otherwise wrong in some sense. And in particular, there was a widespread belief that gay men were pretty much the same thing as, as pedophiles. So in this situation, activists in the gay community had to organize to defend the community from hatred and threats. Um, I spoke to somebody who had been a close friend of, of the victim and was around the same age. And he remembered joining that march to City Hall. And at first, you know, believing in that homophobia, basically. But he also said that he knew, in his words, deep down inside, that it was pedophiles who killed his friend and not gay men, and that these were two completely different groups of people. Uh, he also remembered how a prominent gay rights activist very bravely tried to speak to the Regent Park contingent at the march, and that it worked to at least some extent. So some of the marchers even intervened and tried to stop others from yelling homophobic slurs. So in the aftermath of all of this, uh, shoe shining stopped, so young people lost a relatively safe and harmless way to make extra money, and uh, the person I interviewed who knew the victim told me that that's the point at which he turned to shoplifting, and then professional thieving, and then mid-level drug dealing. This was a moral panic that targeted the gay community, and as often happens in moral panics, other marginalized groups joined in as well. Um, so in this moment of panic and despair, some Regent Parkers took part in this law and order crackdown that further marginalized their own community while also targeting another marginalized group. One of the other points I'm making is that it was stigmatization and neglect that caused insecurity in Regent Park and that made children vulnerable, much more so than urban planning. The reality is the state was not protecting Regent Park youth from predators. It was local adults who were doing that through their everyday actions. Uh, the man I interviewed, who had been a friend of the victim, told me some stories that took place a few years after this, by the mid-1980s when he was a, a drug dealer and a professional thief in, in his 20s. He wasn't proud of those things at the time of our interview, but at that time he had also been one of the local adults who children would go to for help. So if there was a suspicious outsider walking around the neighborhood, uh, offering kids to you know money to go take a walk with them, uh, kids would go report this to the guys standing in front of their buildings who were often considered criminals. And that's who would go confront the stranger. So there were eyes on the street in the old Regent Park. Um, and the people who were presumed to be threats actually provided a good deal of the protection. So children knew that so-called criminals like this, is that's who would protect them from predators. So what's happened since is that community policing, uh, CCTV cameras, 
they remove people like that from the streets. People often had to do their own policing in a sense, and that's another example of what I call extra domestic labor, everyday tasks done just outside the household that are essential to you know keep the community safe and functional. And it's things that people in middle class neighborhoods can kind of take for granted having someone else do for them by way of the state. Meanwhile, the actual police were remembered pretty negatively by most. So you can say there was like a continuum of police interventions. At one end, there was the so-called Cherry Beach Express, which was this widely known practice of the police taking people to the beach at night, beating them, abandoning them, often throwing their shoes in, in the lake. Uh, one person I interviewed said that it was young black men who were especially vulnerable to this. So the Cherry Beach Express was widely known. It was documented. Um, people leaving the bars on Church Street in the gay village late at night would, would leave in groups because they were worried about the Cherry Beach Express. Uh, there was a, a local rock band had a, had a, had a radio hit, a song called the Cherry Beach Express, that was about exactly what I'm talking about. That was 1984. That's why I'm riding on the Cherry Beach Express. My ribs are broken and my face is in a mess. In, in the early 2000s, someone successfully sued the police over a, a Cherry Beach Express beating that happened to him in 1996. The other side of the continuum was an early example of uh, what's now called community policing. So in 1968, the Toronto Star profiled a pair of, of young, plainclothes officers who would hang around Regent Park attempting to befriend teenagers. And uh, I interviewed somebody else who remembered another pair who did you know, pretty much the same thing a few years later, and he said that him and his peers, uh, you know, they sort of... Uh, you know, put up with them to some extent, but also kind of mocked them as they like awkwardly tried to get information out of everybody. So throughout the history that I'm outlining today, the city also went through some major changes that had a huge effect on Regent Park and that help explain where the current redevelopment comes from. It's these three interrelated processes that have played out in Toronto since the 70s. Neoliberalism, deindustrialization, and multiculturalism slash systemic racism, which I've mentioned in previous episodes. I'll talk about each of them briefly in turn. I've already said a lot about neoliberalism, but just to review, it's, it's a theory of political and economic practice that proposes that human well-being is best secured by private property, free markets, and free trade. And this is the dominant set of logic that has structured the global economy and politics since the late 1970s. Meanwhile, we see deindustrialization. So in Toronto, the, the local economy was deindustrializing at the same time as neoliberalism was beginning to gain traction. And uh, to review the, the, the takeaway from what I said about deindustrialization last time, by the end of the 1980s, the Toronto labor market was more service oriented, more part time, and more suburban than it had been in the past. So, major impact upon working class communities downtown, like Regent Park. Meanwhile, Canada was becoming officially multicultural, but then the industries that new Canadians had been recruited to come work in were shrinking, and manufacturing jobs were moving out to the suburbs, so there was more competition for jobs, and as a result, more intense racism. There was another moral panic in Toronto in the 1980s around the, the crack trade, the trade in crack cocaine. And this was applied uh, not just to Regent Park, but to many low-income communities across the city. I think Regent Park was always one of the most visible. So for example, by October of 1988, police officers were telling the newspapers that they, they couldn't control Regent Park anymore and that it was instead controlled by drug dealers, which is uh, a ridiculous exaggeration to say the least. Uh, around the same time, the Housing Authority began evicting any household in which someone had been caught with crack. Um, so I want to share some stories from the 80s, the 90s, from people who had nothing to do with the drug trade but lived in Regent Park. So these are the, the innocent bystanders standards you often hear about. Uh, women who were mothers of small children at the time, for example. And the point is, we need to see these things with, with some nuance. For example, this quote, a woman who was raising small children at the time said, there was violence at times, but it was based on what people were involved in. I was kind of oblivious. I talked to the guys involved in it every day. They, they were protective of the people they knew. They were part of the community. None of them were saints by a long shot, and a lot of them are dead now. But they were fathers, and they looked out for kids. Another person I spoke to described a scenario from the early 90s uh, when she was working for an agency that, that tried to support people in keeping their housing. She would speak to vulnerable women who you know, would be coerced by a friend or a boyfriend 
into letting people sell drugs out of her apartment. And uh, now, as far as the housing authority is concerned, it's a so-called crack house, and she's vulnerable to eviction. Um, someone else challenged me to imagine myself in the situation of a sole support parent living in poverty with three children, and you know her teenage son suddenly starts bringing home enough cash to pay the rent and other bills. So throughout that era, there was lots more happening than just drugs and violence, but it is an important part of the story, and it's one that's often used to justify the current redevelopment. So I wanted to spend some time out lining what it actually looked like to people who actually experienced it. And I want to mention that not one person blamed the crack trade on the design of Regent Park. It wasn't because the architecture, you know, gave people shady spaces in which to deal drugs. It was because Regent Park was heavily stigmatized and being used by outsiders as a place to make illegal money and recruiting, you know, low-income youth into the kind of lower end and more dangerous aspects of the trade. <laughs> present era, the Regent Park revitalization was officially announced in 2002. The plan is, in five phases, tear down the old housing, replace it with a mix of subsidized housing, market rentals, and condominiums. So they are replacing every unit of social housing eventually, and anyone who moves to make way for redevelopment is guaranteed a place in the new Regent Park. But let's not forget the important qualifiers that I mentioned at the beginning. You know, one problem is after living somewhere else for a few years, not everyone is willing to move again. Um, there were also the three buildings built elsewhere that were used as Regent Park replacement units. And uh, in the end, you know, a little less than one-fifth of the housing in Regent Park will be rent geared to income down from 100%. So yes, they are replacing all of it, but it will look very different when it's done. So the point of all of this, according to the plan, is social inclusion. So according to social mix planning theory, Regent Park's low-income tenants will enjoy social mobility by association with their new middle-class neighbors. Basically, the idea is that having people with some more money around will kind of pull everybody up. And in my view, it's a modern-day example of moral regulation because social inclusion is never clearly defined. It just kind of connotes some things that any reasonable person would uh, agree are good things, like multiculturalism and friendliness and uh, accessible buildings and jobs. It's a key example, I think, of third-way urbanism or, or the hope of having the best of both worlds of the Keynesian and the neoliberal approaches. So it's about rebuilding affordable housing that is now in some cases 70 years old, uh, doing that using private capital, and in a context of a diminished social safety net, deepening racialized poverty and class conflicts. This is uh, the boardwalk, as it was called. It was a 15-foot wide sidewalk that ran down the middle of Regent Park North. This picture was taken at 5.30 in the morning in uh, the summer of 2012, I think it was, and that's why this shot is empty. If I took this picture at any point from, you know, 9 a.m. until midnight, there would be at least a dozen people in this shot. There were always lots of people around um, in front of the buildings, socializing, keeping an eye on things. It was a very lively place. So I did research over a three-year period in the earlier stages of the redevelopment, and I wanted to see whether social inclusion and social mix were really happening, and at that point, the short answer is they, they weren't. Uh, most tenants I spoke to said they didn't know any of the condo owners. Uh, one said her only interaction with them was, was being glared at, and one young person I interviewed who had moved out of Regent Park called the plan the, the revitalization attack. And here's a quote from her when I asked about how it impacted her life to, to move out of Regent Park. She said, in a lot of ways it destroys a lot, like it takes a lot from you, possibly physically because you're not in the same space. Mentally, you lose a community. In other words, you don't feel that connectedness as you do while you're in Regent Park when you go out to the, the new neighborhood because I don't even know my neighbor's names, where before I knew the whole family next door to me and so forth, right down the line, it's not the same. I asked some young people if they expected to be connected to this place where they had spent their whole lives in, you know, five or ten years. And this was a typical response. Uh, somebody said, I don't know if it's going to be the same. Like, do I want to work with, sorry, but snobby white people? No, not to say these are the only kinds of people that are going to be involved here, but if it's all these expensive condos that the people I grew up with can't afford, then I'm probably not going to be involved. There was also a lot said about participatory planning and the idea that, you know, residents had a lot of say in what the plan would look like. A lot of meetings were held to get public input. But people described the, the, the extent of their participation 
as being pretty limited. So they'd be asked questions like, you know, how far away should the dog park be from the playground in the new park? And not kind of fundamental questions about, you know, whether it's a good idea to begin with, et cetera. Um, people were also giving input on decisions that wouldn't be made or, or, or implemented for potentially 10 or 15 years after the fact, which is especially meaningless to people who are young adults now and took part in, you know, youth consultations 13 years ago when they were in middle school. People always ask me if the Regent Park revitalization is this gentrification, and then they ask me what I think should have happened instead. So I'll start with the first question. Um, this is not your typical kind of gentrification that starts with a rent gap, and then you know artists and students move in, and then professionals move in, and then old residents are displaced, and then it's an elite area. That's not really what's happening in this case. This is the redevelopment of a housing project into something, quote, like any other neighborhood, as the policy documents say. But that neighborhood is going from being 100% low income to a little under 20% low income, and the businesses on nearby streets are upscaling as a result. So it is gentrification. It's just not the kind that is usually recognized as gentrification. As for what should have happened, uh, this is how a lifelong resident explained it to me, and I co-signed this. This person told me, no one should ever have to see what some kids saw here, and people should be able to go to a bank machine and buy good food. Everybody deserves that. But why are we only getting these things now that other people own homes here? The same person was also angry that all of the new retail space so far was occupied by corporate chains, and so most of the jobs that were created were low-waged, if not minimum wage. So in this person's words, nobody from Regent Park made any real money, while well, so many people made tons of money off of the redevelopment. I think that comment is challenging us to think more radically about what rights people should have over the space on which they live. Now legally, the low income tenants of Regent Park are just that, they're tenants, they don't own the land. But maybe there could have been a way for people who have spent decades on that land, uh, building community, making it livable, to get more out of the redevelopment than another rental unit and some corporate franchises nearby. So the same person I was speaking to suggested that that, that corporate uh, supermarket, that could have been a community-run food co-op, for example. I also have a problem with this idea of a mixed community because rich and poor already live side by side in many Toronto neighborhoods, and not just Toronto, this is typical of cities worldwide, specifically in areas that are in the earlier stages of gentrification. So as far as I'm concerned, social mix, social inclusion, in a lot of ways these are nicer ways of saying gentrification, and gentrification almost always causes displacement, at least at some point. So in the end, I would rather live in the new housing than in the old housing. But my point is that unless we're ready to actually deal with those structural pieces, the problems caused by neoliberalism, deindustrialization, and systemic racism, then not much will change below the surface. So that was some selections from the history of Regent Park. There is a lot more I could have said. Uh, for every point I made, there's a counterpoint, you know, at least one, and more nuance for every story, there's lots more like it. But covering 60 years in the history of a community of roughly 10,000 people at any one time inevitably involves some omission and some simplification. And plus this video is basically a, a 300 page PhD dissertation that's been distilled down into a video that clocks in at a little under an hour. Uh, this video is one episode in an introduction to anthropology series, so in making it I had to go with the moments of the story that are most relevant to the course that, that this is a part of, but at some point in the future I want to expand this into a, a larger video project that is more worthy of this complicated and fascinating place called Regent Park. And any questions, comments, or thoughts, I'd be very happy to receive them, 416anthropology at gmail.com. So like I said, that was a case study in urban anthropology. It was my historical ethnography of Regent Park, Canada's first large-scale, low-income housing project based on my doctoral research that I did in that community. Next episode continues with that urban focus, but it shifts to the United States with a look at the structural shifts that have occurred in American cities since the post-war era and also some ethnographies of what it was like to live through that. So thanks for watching. Back in a couple of days. For that.